Gone Fishing Part 7 The Trials of Gail Maney Three days before Gail Maney goes on trial for murder, she totally changes the way she looks. She describes it in her diary. February 26, 1998. Today I dyed my hair. Well, we went to a hairdresser who charged $75 and turned my hair pink. We ditched my jewellery and bought a long, plain black skirt for court so I looked like a plain mother. Gross. I'm not even going to moose hairspray or blow wave it every day. The police say I'm a woman men just want to do favours for because of my sex appeal sort of thing. Being blonde with styled hair and jewellery makes me look more that way. I feel stripped of who I am. I cried my eyes out afterwards. Stuff and RNZ, this is Gone Fishing, a podcast by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. Gail Maney dies here here on the Friday. On the Monday, that's the 1st of March 1999, she's in court. It's nine years, six months and eight days since Dean Fuller Sands disappeared. It's one year, seven months and 26 days since Gail was arrested for his murder. Gail was 22 when Dean went missing, she's 31 now. And over the next few weeks, 12 jurors will decide how Gail is going to spend the rest of her life. You already know how this bit ends. Gail will be found guilty of the murder of Dean Fuller Sands. Stephen Stone will be found guilty of Dean's murder and the rape and murder of Leah Stevens. Mark Henriksen and Gail's little brother Colin will be found guilty of being accessories after the fact to Dean's murder. And actually, there will be one more trial after this one. The following year, the appeal court will say that the first trial judge made errors summing up. So Gail and Mark Henriksen get a retrial. That's in May 2000. And the new jury finds them both guilty again. The transcript from that first trial in 1999 runs to 732 pages. There are 74 witnesses. There are four teams of defence lawyers. It goes on for four weeks. It gets really complicated. For the retrial in 2000, you'd think it would be simpler. But even with just one murder to cover and half the number of defendants, it still takes almost four weeks. That transcript is 559 pages. There are some important differences in the way Gail's defence is run between the two trials, but we're going to look mostly at the first, given that most of the retrial is just a repeat of that. Gail's memories of the trial are still vivid. I was out on bail, um, so going to court every day to the trial was quite, I guess it was daunting. Um, I'd never been to a trial before, let alone a murder trial. And then we had to face the media would be there um, and I would I ran from them because they would be like run after me with their cameras and it was quite scary. So, and you know, and I used to think about my children and I just knew that I was innocent and um, you just want people to know that. But, you know, like you've got the jury who, you know, they're just Joe Bloggs from society and they don't know anything about law or whatever. Um, They're just trying to do their duty. Um, And they fall asleep during the trial and it's important stuff and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, like, this is my life and these people are falling asleep and um, they need to be listening and, yeah. These were during the trial. The court transcript gives us the official record, but Gail also kept a diary. She started it before the first trial and kept it going well into her prison years. Gail lent Amy about seven volumes of her diaries. She read out an entry for us. So the jury's been out for three days today. The waiting really starts to get to you after a while. I can't stop pacing. It would be the last birthday present for I can't really accept my son's birthday on the day I got convicted. Um, so yeah, it would be the best birthday present for if his mum came home today. Do you know my son still tells me like he remembers the day that I went away? He said you told me you were going to come home. Um, anyway. <laughs> so we go up for our verdict. I'm so scared. S- Steve 
psychoed, um, psychoed out on me for crying, demanding, you can cut that out. They said guilty. I was shaking all over. I felt shocked. <laughs> I don't know if I can read it. <laughs> um, felt shocked and numb. We didn't do it. I don't know how they came back with guilty. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in there that Gail doesn't want shared, some really private stuff. But the diaries are also full of sharply observed moments from the trial that are really worth hearing. We didn't want to put Gail through reading them all out, so Amy's doing that instead. Such as Gail's first day in court. March 1, 1998. I want to cry, but it doesn't seem right. I don't know how I feel. Quite detached, I suppose. It's a strange feeling, like I'm watching myself. Gail writes about the day the entire court takes a day trip. We all travel to Whatipu in a prison van. The jury, the Crown, judges, and the lawyers all go in two buses. The media were there and they took pictures of us. It was on the 6pm news. People don't stop ringing me to tell me they saw it. I wish they'd give it a break. It took one hour ten to get to Whatipu. Then we travelled to Larnock Road. One of the cameras filmed me in the garage. I was laughing and talking, unaware the vultures were doing it. They played it on TV. A man with a camera at Fatipu keeps trying to sneak up on me and get a picture of me and Steve together. I must stay away from him. This is the shot they want. Later in this entry, Gail adds, This is awful, but it beats sitting in court all day. The judge ate a chocolate cake, everyone dressed down. It was a sociable day. Actually, in her interview with us, Gail says a bit more about that Larnock Road visit. It was kind of weird and kind of surreal just going back there. and People were still living in the house, so they had a note on the door which referred to that someone had been um, murdered in this house. But it was said in a, it was kind of like in a quirky kind of way, like, um, like, like the kind of thinking it was like a cool thing or something, I don't know. <laughs> Gail's on bail through all this, so she's also juggling childcare and relationship problems. The media coverage is a constant worry. Gail writes, The Herald printed about me and Steve having a threesome. The state of it, how embarrassing. I guess they love gossip. She worries about her children reading the coverage. Colleen got the Herald, it's front page of us at Fatipu. My face was shown all over the news, but it didn't really look like me. My poor kids, look what I've done to them. And of course, there's this. I just went shopping. I wonder if anyone recognises me. I hate my new hair colour. Stuck in the dock with nothing much to say or do, Gail turns out to be a very acute observer and an elegant writer. Early on, she writes, The days are long and the seat's uncomfortable. There are awkward interactions with her co-defendants. Steve gets mad at me for crying. Mark Henriksen reached for my hand in the dock. This made the tears flow. Mark H gave me his handkerchief. I had no choice but to use it. Gross. It was already used. And she turns a cynical eye on the stream of witnesses. A man called Richard Holloway gives evidence. He's now saying he used to visit Larnock Road and says he saw me arguing with Dean. God, I've never met this guy in my life. I'm sure Richard thinks I'm someone else. Gail closely watches Sonia, her former friend who's now one of the four key witnesses. Sonia talks through gritted teeth like she doesn't want to really say the lies she's saying. The police have bullied and manipulated her so much. And of course, Tanya Wilson gives evidence. Gail's old childhood friend pointing the finger once again. When she came back after a break, her eyes held briefly. I know, she knows, I know, she doesn't want to do this. She is scared of the police and didn't mean for it to go this far. I know her so well. Tanya seems slightly drugged out, maybe on Valium or something. Numerous cops take the stand, including Ken Danby. He turned and gave us all a look of contempt. The scammy bastard. He's really out for just a conviction. He doesn't want to look at the flaws in this case. He's right up Mark Franklin's arse. Mark Franklin, the lead investigator, is in court every day. He is a squirmy slimeball head of this inquiry. He truly knows this isn't true. He just wants us in jail and his brownie points, although I'm sure he's worried, as he hunches over, trying to pull his head into his shoulders, constantly blinking, he can't keep still, his fingernails that he anxiously gnaws away. Body language says a lot. This is such a striking image of Franklin that we asked him about it. 
this was probably the most difficult um, and complex investigation um, that I'd done. And yes, it took its toll on me. Obviously, a, a significant amount, amount of stress. This was important to me. Um, there were families there. I was trying to do the best. But yeah, I, I was stressed during the trial. Just a quick detour here. All the way back in part one, we mentioned Franklin got into a spot of bother in Rarotonga after he left the police. He was jailed for some minor cannabis charges. In an interview with a Kiwi reporter in 2013, while still in jail, Franklin admitted he'd smoked dope when he was still a cop to help with the stress of the job. And which case did he name as the most stressful? This one. In fact, during the investigation, Franklin was smoking a joint while walking with friends in downtown Auckland and bumped into some cops he knew. Franklin told his supervisor about the incident, and nothing came of it, but it was embarrassing. So sure, Franklin tells us, he smoked a bit of weed while running this investigation, but... I was extremely conscious to keep my social life away from my police work. Um, And sure, on occasions in the evening, I'd have a drink, and maybe I'd have a a smoke of cannabis every now and then, a bit of weed. Um... I found that helped me relax in the, in, in the evenings. Um, I certainly never, ever did it um, at work. There had to be a clear distinction. Um, and I was very, very careful about my circle of friends. Um, yep, yeah, there could be allegations that, yeah, he was smoking weed, he's got it all wrong. Sorry, that doesn't wash with me. Um, I'm very, very focused. I believe I did an extremely good job in the New Zealand police. There were checks and balances in terms of what I was doing. Uh, and the Crown. So any suggestion by anyone that me smoking weed made a, a impact on this is completely wrong, I'm sorry. OK, fair enough. But back to Gail's diary. She says the first time she learns the awful details of Leah Stevens' death is in court, as Neil gives evidence. Remember, Neil and Martin receive full immunity in exchange for giving evidence, so they both describe in terrible detail how they were there when Dean Fuller Sands was shot dead in a crowded garage, and also there when Stephen Stone raped and killed Leah. This is how Gail reacts to Neil's evidence. I still feel so sickened by the things Neil said they did to Leah. It's so gross. I don't understand the police. How can they let him walk? This is such a cover-up. Framed. We've been framed. Gail saves some of her most savage pen portraits for Neil and Martin. This is her take on Neil. I've never seen this guy. He's a strange guy and has a bad vibe. He seems slightly simple. He's dressed in black Levi's and a grey t-shirt. When he talks about what he did to Leah, giving graphic details of raping her and killing her, he gets excited and talks of slitting a sheep's throat in comparison to Leah. As he goes through his different versions in just a plain monologue voice with no emotion, yuck, I can't handle it. I want to get up and run from the courtroom, but I can't. I sit and cry as I listen. I never read any statements and wasn't prepared for this. Here's what she says before Martin takes the stand. I hope I don't spin out. I found it hard enough dealing with Neil's evidence, wanting to run away and not listen anymore. But I'm trapped in this numbing wooden box with guards around me and nowhere to hide. So many eyes upon us, watching every twitch. Apparently, Martin takes a bit more care with his appearance than Neil. He is very well presented in a navy suit, a flash new gold watch, new expensive leather shoes. He sends shivers up and down my spine. His aura is so dark. With his small, beady, dark eyes, he turns and glares evilly at Steve S and quickly glances at the rest of us. I can feel that he must have known Steve, although Steve denies this. He is very well practiced. He's not as stupid as Neil, but he is more creepy again. Here we go through all the lies. I have never met him either, nor has he been to Owl Road. Gail discovers that Martin's actually staying just a few blocks from her bail address. Her old mate Billy is up from Waihe and staying with her. They're a bit freaked out to realise Martin is so close. Billy and I decide to get in the car in our nighties and drive around the block past Martin's address, although it's past my curfew. We lock the house up tight tonight, knowing a rapist and murderer lives just around the corner. Neil and Martin give Gail the creeps. 
but their evidence is pivotal in the trial. Stephen Stone's lawyer, Roger Chambers, is clear about the impact of Martin's testimony. It was vivid, and it linked the two murders. One of those witnesses who had immunity was all the evidence that he gave. He was present when um, Leah Stevens' throat was cut. He gave that evidence. He gave it pretty confidently, as I recall, and I think that was very much a major factor in the jury decision. That it's, It really gave credence to what the police theory was on what occurred with Fuller Sands, that she'd been executed because she was about to crack. That's how Franklin saw it too. The jury was reacting to the witnesses. I mean, this was pretty gory detail. I mean, people getting shot in the head. And then particularly the the evidence around Leah Stevens and the, the rape and the killing. This was heavy stuff. The jury knew that the four key witnesses had lied. But part of their job was to decide whether those lies mattered. Neil's in particular. Clearly he changed his stories several, numerous times, multiple times, and his credibility was on the line. He, his credibility was suspect. I mean, me as a police officer, I knew that, but that's the job of a jury is to assess credibility and, and to take what weight they want from his, his evidence. Yep, that is the job of the jury. But the jury finds everyone guilty in the end, which means that, obviously, they do give way to some questionable evidence. That's one of the things that bothers me. Given all the different ways that the defence kicked holes in the police case, why was everyone found guilty? Over the past year, I've sometimes felt like a weather vane on the issue of Gail's guilt or innocence. Depending on what I've just read or who we've just interviewed, I find myself flipping back and forth. Reading the trial transcripts was one of those times when I could feel the wind shifting in the direction of guilty. Not because the prosecution had any single show-stopping piece of evidence, and not because the defence seemed to mess anything up. It was more that whenever the four defence teams cast doubt on some aspect of the prosecution case, the Crown would cast doubt straight back. And whenever that happened, my thoughts on that particular argument would end up kind of neutralised. Useless as an argument either for or against Gail's guilt. And if all those clashes end in stalemate, you start to reach for other criteria. Things like, do you generally think the police are honest? Or do these look like the kind of people who might have murdered a guy? I didn't watch the trials in person, but I wonder if the two juries had a similar experience to mine. A feeling of being slightly overwhelmed by the complexity of the case, and also of being unsure of just what to believe. Okay, let's break some of that down. Let's start with the simplest argument of all for Gail's innocence, the gone fishing theory. Maybe the reason Dean Fuller-Sand's death was considered a drowning for so long is because that's quite simply what happened. He fished at Fatipum. It was a dangerous night. His car was in the car park, and when it was found, there was a towel draped over the car stereo. And that was something Dean always did. Those objects that were washed up? A torch, a soap dish, some CRC, really could have been his. Not everyone who gets swept away at Fatipu gets washed back ashore, so it's not particularly odd that Dean was never found. The inquest officer admitted as much in his letter to Dean's sister, Leonie Curran, in 1995. But in court, that same inquest officer tells a prosecution lawyer that 99% of bodies do get washed up. And those items found were really standard fishing kit. Who can say if they were Dean's? Plus, the prosecution present a witness, another fisherman, who apparently recalls seeing Dean's distinctive burnt orange Hillman Avenger in the Fotipu car park early in the morning after Dean disappears. This guy says the car is gone by midday. The people at Fotipu Lodge say they saw the Avenger later in the day, and they reckon it was in a different position from what the fisherman said. The point is that this seems to match Martin's crazy story about Dean's car being taken to Fotipu, then retrieved to remove fingerprints, then dropped there a second time. And it's kind of interesting that when Amy talked to Dean's mate Jean Davey, he said he had spotted something odd too. I remember when I first saw the car, I I, I suspect that something really weird had happened because I saw where the car was parked, and, and I just remember that's not where he would park the car. So what should you believe? (laughs) 
Okay, the unreliable witnesses. This is such a big deal. And we spent most of part four and five talking about it. So I'm not going to go into all the details. But Neil, Martin, Tanya, Sonia, they are the heart of the police case. And they are all liars. Yeah, and the defence lawyers do a great job of showing just how much lying has gone on. Their cross-examination of these four is brutal. But the prosecution presents a pretty good counter-narrative. They try to show how every lie by every witness always has a purpose, and that purpose is to create the maximum distance possible between the liar and their own involvement in a crime. For example, early on, Tanya and Sonia admit to seeing a body in a boot but they claim they only saw it from a distance and didn't know who it was. They only admit to seeing Dean's actual death after the police return with new information. And often, when the police come back with something that places a witness closer to a crime, the witness will concede that part of the story, but keep lying about the rest. Even something as outrageously fictitious as the murder of Steve No. 2 arguably fits this model. I mean, why would Neil admit not only to his involvement with Leah's death, but also invent an extra, imaginary murder of this guy, Steve No. 2. It seems crazy. But the prosecution suggests there's a logic even behind this kind of lie. Neil knows if the police find Martin, Martin might tell the full story of Dean's murder, which Neil has totally sidestepped till now. So when describing Leah's murder, Neil gives Martin a fake name, Steve No. 2. And just to make sure the cops don't go looking for him, he claims Steve No. 2 is dead. To make it even more convincing, he says he actually helped Stone kill him. So it's not just a crazy fantasy. It's a calculated strategy to keep his distance from Dean's murder at Larnack Road. I'm not saying I completely buy this explanation for Neil's wild stories. He has an enthusiasm for dishonesty that I think goes way beyond self-preservation. But this kind of argument does provide a model for the jury of how you can question dishonest people collect a pile of lies and yet still find the truth in there. So little by little, the police iron out all, or at least many, of the wrinkles in all the different statements. Remember what Franklin said to us. I'm still not convinced that um, they all told the truth, but I think we've got a long way there and certainly, in my view, sufficient for the convictions. OK, here's the biggie, though. Catherine Sauer's house was not built at the time when she was meant to be witnessing a burglary. There's clear documentary proof of this from the plumber and the electrician. If Sal was living there, she'd have been shivering all winter and there would have been sewage on the lawn. Dean disappeared on the 21st of August 1989, but Sal's house wasn't even habitable till October. Which means any burglary she witnessed must have happened long after Dean had already gone missing. And that makes a total nonsense of the idea that Gail wanted Dean dead because she thought he was the burglar. If you undermine the motive like this, surely the whole prosecution case against Gail stops making sense. Sure, this is the defence argument that convinces me the most too. But in court, the prosecution still managed to neutralise it. On the stand, Catherine Siles swears black and blue that she was living in the house as early as July. The prosecution also implied that she was the kind of person who would have happily camped in a half-finished house. They also find someone who jibbed the house, who has some complicated memories about the timing. There is endless tedious discussion of the rules around plumbing consents and the current supply to a builder's pole and the Henderson drainage plan. It's very confusing and very boring all at once. And if I got this bored and confused on this issue, maybe the jury did too. I mean, we know from Gail's diary that people literally nodded off in court sometimes. If you're bored and confused by a piece of evidence, perhaps you just let it go. Ignore it. And if you ignore this evidence, that's really going to help the prosecution. In her diary of this day, Gail writes, Catherine Sowell got up today. She was a blubbering idiot. She made a total fool of herself rambling on. I've got to say, the court transcript does seem to match Gail's view on this. Sal is all over the place during cross-examination. Yeah, at one point, Gail's lawyer Mark Edgar asked Sal what she told police when they first visited her. And Sal admits she hadn't a clue what the police were asking her. She tells the court, They came to my door and wanted to know if I knew the neighbours and it was just blah, 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 blah. I mean... Also... 
Edgar draws out the fact that the very first time police ask Sal what date she moved into the house, she actually says October. She only switches that date to July during later questioning by police. I've always found this change of her story so sketchy. Anyway, there's also Gail's other timeline defence. Remember, she says she didn't go off the rails and didn't meet Stephen Stone until September 1989, several weeks after Dean was already missing. The private investigator John Bradley found those receipts that seemed to back this up. He put a lot of weight on this, remember? I found the trade exchange where Gail advertised, and that brought us down to three days. Three days for her to admit Stephen Stone, turned from just an ordinary mum to a drug-using prostitute with all this stuff going on. That's what I can never come to terms with, how, how that could be so overlooked. This timeline didn't get much attention at the first trial. Gail's lawyer, Mark Edgar, didn't make a big deal of it, and Gail didn't give evidence herself in that trial, even though she'd rather wanted to. But the timeline was presented in more detail at the retrial, when Gail had a new lawyer, Peter Kay. Oddly, though, the Crown didn't spend much time attacking it. They just suggested Gail had got the details wrong. What about that dubious half hour at Henderson Police Station where Mark Franklin was alone with Martin? The one where immediately afterwards, Martin suddenly starts talking about knowing Dean Fuller Sands and being there when he was murdered. Sure. The defence went really hard on Franklin about this during cross-examination. They suggested he'd bullied or even coached Martin. This is the half hour that Franklin now says he doesn't even recall. You'll remember, though, that he told us he's confident he wouldn't have done anything dodgy. So I know that that witness is going to be giving evidence on oath under cross-examination and I'd be cutting my own throat if I did or said anything to that witness to jeopardise this case. Anyway, in court in 1999, Franklin's memories of that were much fresher and he just got on the stand and said these things happen in investigations and he'd done nothing wrong. Which meant this issue too was thrown back to the jury to decide whether it even mattered or not. You know, I reckon the jury must also have been swayed by the evidence about Gail's character. Remember her former partner Chris Martin talks about her smashing him over the head with a Jim Beam bottle. In the second trial, when Gail's on the stand, she gets asked about the time she threatened a neighbour in Waihi with a knife. And there are those terrible tales Tanya tells about Gail violently attacking people in pubs. Actually, the defence pushes back on this pretty effectively. Chris Martin is reminded that during one fight, he broke Gail's jaw. That was at a Metallica concert. He also admits he's in the middle of a custody battle with Gail, so he stands to benefit if she goes down. The neighbour in Waihi? Gail tells the court the neighbour had just thrown her daughter over a fence. So she was angry about that. And the knife in her hand was just a small paring knife. She'd been peeling potatoes for dinner. And stories about Gail's bad behaviour coming from Tanya Wilson? Like we said before, her credibility is suspect. So far, we've run through just a handful of the most glaring problems with the prosecution case. But believe me, there are more. And they keep coming up as Adam and I go over and over this case. So let me share some of them with you and see what you make of them. First, there's the gunshots. Dean's meant to have been shot eight times in the garage at Larnock Road in the afternoon with the garage door open. An unsilenced 22 revolver makes a really loud bang. How come no neighbours heard that? Then, there's the mattress. Police tested Tanya's mattress. The one Leah is meant to have died on nearly a decade later and... They found blood spots, but this does nothing to corroborate Leah's murder. Tanya had given birth on that bed, so of course there was some blood. And the tests couldn't extract any DNA, so it's impossible to say whose blood it is. Also, Tanya kept that mattress for years after August 1989. Would someone seriously keep on sleeping on a bed they knew someone had been murdered on? I also want to mention the police raid at Larnock Road. This is something we haven't discussed before, but in September 1989, very soon after the two alleged murders at Larnock Road, police raided the place looking for stolen goods, and of course, they found them. 
So police were stomping around and looking in the boots of cars just weeks after two murders were meant to have taken place and two bodies had been driven around in those cars. Not only that, but the police removed the cars from the property. Sure, those police weren't actively looking for evidence of murder at the time, but it seems pretty amazing that nothing suspicious was noticed. There's another thing the defence lawyers do during the trials. They hint at a couple of radically different theories about what happened to Dean. Personally, I'm not sold on either of them. But this is what defence lawyers do. Their job is to raise reasonable doubt about the Crown case. If offering up half-baked alternative theories can do that, it's fair game. One of these theories concerns the headhunters, a gang with a pretty big profile in West Auckland. And there were headhunter connections to the Larnock Road scene and also to Dean. Dean's workmate, Gene Davey, tells the court he saw Dean have a tense conversation with some headhunters shortly before he disappeared. Gene told Amy about this too. He says he and Dean had been driving when some headhunters in a Cadillac signalled to them to pull over. Dean got out of the car. That was over in Glen Need, and from memory, pulled over and got out and was chatting to them. And, you know, and then might have been five minutes, and then he got back in and drove off, but he seemed pretty agitated when he got back in the car. The inference the jury's invited to draw here is that perhaps Dean was murdered, but by someone who the police have failed to identify, probably because they're so focused on their Stephen Stone narrative. In another line of questioning about Dean's state of mind, it's implied that he'd been depressed or even suicidal because of a relationship breakup. So maybe he drowned at Fatipu, but not by accident. In court, Dean's brother Wayne Fuller Sands fends off repeated suggestions that Dean had been suicidal. He says Dean was upset, but not depressed. You can sense him losing patience with the questions. He snaps back at Mark Edgar once, well, if your wife was leaving you, wouldn't you cry? Yeah, those theories aren't ever fully developed in court, but I think it's useful to remember that there are alternatives to what the police say happened. Sometimes it feels like the police's tight focus on scenario one and later scenario two was so overwhelming that they didn't even scratch the surface of other possibilities. And even that depression scenario, that didn't come out of nowhere. When Dean first went missing, suicide was discussed as one of the possibilities. Aside from all the clashes of evidence for and against, there's another thing that really strikes me about the trial transcripts. There are dozens of witnesses, so the jury hears a lot from people who moved in the orbit of Larnock Road or in the club and sex scene of Kay Road. It's a window into a distinct and quite strange section of New Zealand society. These witnesses give details about their lives back in 1989, the partying, the drug taking, the sex work, the violence, the casual criminality, the general roiling chaos of their lives. And they make it sound like it was some kind of Herculean test, something to endure, but also to be proud of. One former sex worker, street named Tiffany, says she can't remember whether the gap between two particular events was weeks or years. I wouldn't be sure, she says. They were pretty hard days. The parties at Larnock Road, one witness says, were just standard parties. When we got there, he says, there was a big punch-up happening in the lounge. A doorman called Wayne has been questioned when the lawyer asks him, you've got a nickname of Fluff? Yes, says Wayne, or Fluff, it's spelled F-L-U-F. Does that refer to your hair, does it? The lawyer asks. No, says Wayne. So what does it mean? Oh, says Wayne, it stands for Fat Little Ugly Fornicator. That's the polite version. Many of the witnesses have a pretty ropey relationship with authority and not much respect for the dignity of the court. There's a moment when Sonia is being cross-examined by Gail's lawyer Peter Kay during the retrial. Kay is challenging Sonia's claim that she actually saw Stephen Stone shoot Dean. Did you see this gun? He asks. Not clearly, no, says Sonia. Did you hear a noise? Yes, says Sonia. What did it sound like? I have no idea, says Sonia. Kay tries again. You describe to me as best you can the sound of what you say was this gun going off in the garage. Bang, says Sonia. There's a truly bizarre bit during the retrial when Neil was asked by a defence lawyer about his return to Auckland to give evidence. Neil says he asked for $30,000 cash, business class flights, the use of a Ferrari and the presidential suite at the Stamford Plaza. 
He says, I'd like to keep the Ferrari I'm driving around in at the moment, but they won't let me. Wait, what? The police gave a witness a Ferrari? This obviously disturbs the cops, because when he's re-examined by the Crown, the record gets set straight. Is the arrangement, asked the prosecutor Howard Laurie, that you've been provided with economy airfare to travel here, accommodation in somewhere other than a presidential suite, and meals? Yep, Neil admits, that's right. Was the arrangement, says Laurie, that if you didn't come up, the police would seek to have you brought back and prosecuted? Yes, says Neil. So this man, for no reason I can see, other than to amuse himself or wind up the judge, has chosen to spin yet another gratuitous lie, this time while actually standing in the dock, under oath and at a high court trial, where he is giving graphic evidence about a rape and two murders that he watched and did nothing to prevent. There is seriously something wrong with the sky. When they hear from people like Tanya and Sonia, and from Neil and Martin, and everyone else, the jury is learning about a whole subculture of people who operate outside respectable society, and outside the law. They're getting a peek into a world where, yeah, maybe the kind of crazy stuff the Crown is alleging really could happen. Our colleague Tony Wall, who watched some of the trial as a reporter, put it this way. There was such a sort of a wild bunch of people that you just kind of had preconceived perceptions about them, I guess, that they were maybe scumbags and that they got what they deserved kind of thing. And the cops did a pretty good job of unravelling a cold case mystery. They, you know, they were having to get some unsavoury people to turn and talk. The jury goes out at lunchtime on a Wednesday. Gail has packed a bag because she has to be in custody until the verdict comes back. This is from her diary of that day. March 24, 1999. 9pm. The jury are tired and so is everyone else. We all retire for the night. We have to go to Mount Eden Prison. Fear and panic grip me. I don't want to go. Please God, don't do this. Why? And then the Thursday. Still no verdict. I'm so scared. This didn't happen. I wish it was all over. It's worse, the waiting. I've got a nervous rash on my tummy. I pray they will make the right decision for us. And then the Friday, which happens to be Gail's little boy's birthday. There are two entries that day. In the morning, Gail writes, The jury's been out three days today. I can't stop pacing. It would be the best birthday present for if his mum came home today. Of course, Mark Franklin is in court on the day the jury comes back. Now, during our first interview with Franklin, we got talking about how Gail has never changed her story, right from the first time police interviewed her. So we asked Franklin if there was any moment he could recall, at any point in the investigation, where Gail had wavered or admitted to anything relating to Dean's death. And Franklin told us about something that happened that final day of the trial. Something Gail said from the dock. The court was stony silent, excuse the pun, but the court was silent and the jury came back with the verdict and she called out, we didn't mean to. And as she said that, Stone came across and said, not guilty, to drown her out. Now, I heard it, the Crown Prosecutor heard it and other people in the court heard it. This seems amazing. Franklin's pretty much saying Gail made a near confession as she was taken away. We checked what the court reporters said, and sure enough, according to the New Zealand Herald article that ran the next morning, quote, A tearful and distraught Gail Maney looked at the public gallery packed with supporters from all sides and said, We never meant to. Her final words trailed off inaudibly. Of course, we asked Gail about this. I remember that the media did say something, but it wasn't what I said. I think I might have said something like, we didn't do it, or I didn't know him, or something like that. I probably got it written in a diary or somewhere that I wrote at the time. And she's right. This is how Gail recorded that moment in her diary, written before the Herald article had even run. 11.40am. We go out for our verdict. I am so scared. Steve psychoed out on me for crying, demanding, you can cut that out. They said guilty. I was shaking all over. 
I felt shocked, numb. We didn't do it. I don't know how they came back with guilty. I've never met Leah or Dean or Neil or Martin. Steve yelled, not guilty, as he barged past me. I said through tears, we didn't even know them. We didn't mean to. We never meant to. We didn't even know them. Right to the last moment of the trial, the Gail Maney story is about the way different people talk about the same events and how those accounts never quite match up. Gail's closest friend Billy was in court, but Billy's partner Brett had other things to take care of. On the day that Gail and Billy and that went to court and Gail finally got sentenced, we were at home preparing to go to Lollipop's land for his fifth birthday and waiting for Billy to get home with his mother. But Billy came home on her own. So we still had to go to Lollipop's land with a little boy who was looking forward to his birthday but really wanted his mum for his birthday. Gail Maney and Stephen Stone are given their life sentences on the day. Colin Maney and Mark Henriksen are sentenced a few weeks later. Three years for Henriksen, two years suspended for Colin. Stephen Stone gets another 10 years for Leah's rape, but you can't make a life sentence any longer. So, as the judge says, it just means he'll have a harder time when he starts applying for parole. A year later, in May 2000, Gail and Mark Henriksen get their retrial. Gail's story during the second trial is a little bit different from the first. She seems tired and sad. In court, she's often bored. There's less of that close observation of all the witnesses. But she's still optimistic. She likes this lawyer more, and she is glad she's given the chance to give evidence herself. I really like Peter Kay. He's, um, he's, quite, he's quite charismatic in the courtroom. <laughs> I suppose you could say. Um, and he was quite understanding about my emotions and feelings, you know, as a woman. And, um, you know, he was really supportive. During this trial, Gail's mind is probably on other things. During the trial, she discovers she's pregnant with twins. Before the jury goes out, for what will be the last time, Gail is hopeful. But the outcome for her and Mark Henriksen is the same. Guilty? and guilty. Gail Maney, pregnant or not, is about to spend a long, long time in prison. Right away, she starts telling the world she's innocent. She writes letters to everyone she can think of. She looks for new grounds for appeal. She keeps writing in her diary. Years pass. And then... According to police, it was a murder that had all the hallmarks of a contract hit, a ruthless killer. Two of the Remember that there were four key witnesses in this case. And now a key Crown witness has come forward. One of them has now decided to retract everything they said in court. Guess who? Now as Gail Maney waits for the Court of Appeal to again hear her case, the police have begun reinvestigating the evidence of Tanya Wilson. That's right. Gail Maney's old friend, Tanya Wilson, is talking about Gail again. She's talking to the investigative TV show Sunday. And this time, she isn't pointing the finger at Gail. This time, she's telling a very different story. Next time on Gone Fishing. I got given a letter saying that she wanted to tell the truth and that she was sorry that she'd lied. I know all about innocent people going to jail. I've been to jail myself. It was shock and horrifying. I even got hypnotised to try and help find Dean. Gone Fishing is a joint production from Stuff and RNZ, written, presented and produced by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. Our executive producers are Tim Watkin and Justin Gregory for RNZ and Catherine Goldsworthy for Stuff. This episode was engineered by Rangi Poek, visuals by Jason Dore. You can subscribe to the full eight-part series at Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other podcast providers. You can also go to the Stuff or RNZ homepages to listen or to find details on how to subscribe. 